ان شاء الله افطارا هنيئا ان شاء الله in about one hour i think and 15 minutes before i start with our dear guests uh, it's good to keep reminding you that this application was designed to make uh, your life easier in what pertains to your deen to your religion it helps you to know your local masjid or any masjid you would love the time that uh, the, the prayer times the iqama times the tarawih and you can book you know we are restricted by the because due to the covid 19 restrictions alhamdulillah alhamdulillah we are not closed as a masjid but however we are facing a real challenge which is we are allowed just 15 percent which means yeah, the small numbers so you can't attend the tarawih or the Jum'ah, or the Eid without, you know, without booking. So you, you can book, you can have an idea about activities, emergencies, janazah prayer, anything, anything comes to your mind. The masjid, which is participating in this app, will be in need to nothing more than just put, you know, small steps. Everyone in the app will be aware of it. It's an amazing tool. It's a management tool. In addition to the fact that it helps you to donate, to help, to support your local masjid just by pressing a small button. Now we come back again to our dear brother, Dr. Mustafa Khattab, uh, the Azhari graduate, Dr. Mustafa Khattab, the specialist in Tafsir al-Quran whom Allah has enabled by his will and Allah bestowed his blessings upon him and enabled him to do two great tafsirs. Tafsir, the normal tafsir in, in, in a, for, the, for the meaning of the Quran, the clear tafsir, and tafsir for kids as well. And he did a great job with this to make it easy in the language. And, and he think his approach was unique because he 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 asked the help of the mentality of the kids while he was preparing, he was consulting kids. How do you understand what reaches you? This is a unique way when you want to write something for the kids. Anyway, without uh, further ado, uh, Tafsir for Kids is our uh, third, I think, session, if, I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, with our dear brother, Dr. Mustafa Khattab. Dr. Mustafa, Salam alaikum wa jazakumullahu khayran. واهلا ومرحبا بكم. وعليكم السلام سعد الدكتور بارك الله فيك جزاك الله خير. جزاك الله. May Allah accept from you. I will leave you with your audience ان شاء الله جزاك الله خير to to enrich them with the with the very beneficial words ما شاء الله. جزاك الله خير. بارك الله خير. بارك الله فيكم. السلام عليكم everyone. بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام عليكم والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه ومن والاه وبعد. It has been a long day with the snow and subhanallah this is the spring. But anyway, <laughs> alhamdulillah. So today, inshallah, I'm going to talk about one ayah from Surah Al-Mujadila, or Al-Mujadala, both riwayatan, both are acceptable. Uh, Surah 58, ayah number 11. يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will elevate, he will raise in rank those of you who have iman, they have faith, and those who seek knowledge. So my focus will be on those who seek knowledge and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will honor the people of knowledge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless Dr. Amjad. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless Muslim Do for putting this uh, amazing platform together. Alhamdulillah to serve the Muslim community and the Masajid. So I have 15 minutes, uh, inshallah. So I'm going to begin with a small story to introduce the topic of seeking knowledge. This is a story of uh, a young man about your age, if, if you are young and you're watching me. So he was born in a small village in Egypt and he didn't have any potential of going to school because everyone in the family was a farmer. And his father told him, you know, you just stay, work with us on the farm. You don't have to go to school. And as a matter of fact, they didn't have a school in the village. But eventually his mother, uh, this young boy from the village in Egypt that I'm talking about, his mother put up a big fight for him. And she told the father that it would be a shame if we have a family of so many and none of us is educated. So basically, they didn't have a school in the village. So eventually, uh, because of his mother, 
He ended up going to school. He had to walk one hour one way and one hour the other way in another village to attend school at Al-Azhar in Egypt, alhamdulillah. So by the age of 12, he completed his hiv, his memorization of the Quran. Then eventually back in 1997, he graduated high school and he went to college in Cairo to study Islam in English. This is good news. However, there was one big problem. And the problem was his English was in the basement because they didn't have qualified English teachers at Al-Azhar in high school. Let me give you a flavor. So basically, he, they taught him to say, for example, too much instead of stomach. So imagine if you go to the doctor and you say, I have a problem, my too much. Nobody will know what you're talking about. Uh, for example, uh, my food, my mansaf, my biryani, my kushari is deliquous, meaning delicious. This is how they taught him to speak. I have extensive ex appearance experience, language for language, and so on and so forth. So the, the new teacher would come and they would say, are you the new English teacher? And he would say, yes, I are. So you can imagine the English was horrible. So this young man, this youth, when he went to college in Egypt to study Islam and English, his English was so bad, but he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because his friends were making fun of him. His pronunciation was in the basement. He says, Ya Allah, he prayed Salatul Isha one night. He says, Ya Allah, uh, you know, you created the sun and the moon and the stars and the galaxies, you know, if you help me with my English, it will be super easy for you. But I promise you right here, right now, that I'm going to use my English and my Islamic knowledge to teach people about Islam and to teach people about the Quran. And subhanAllah, over the next three years, he was learning English, he was listening to the BBC, he was reading Shakespeare, he was watching movies to improve his English. He had language exchange sessions with some American Muslims in Cairo at the time. And after three years, he graduated college, not only the top of his class, by the, the top student in the entire English class. And shortly after, he was appointed as a professor to teach Islamic studies at Al-Azhar in Egypt. Only in three years, subhanAllah, it took him to improve his level of English. So he left Egypt in, 2000, in 2007. Uh, he moved to the U.S. to become an imam. And alhamdulillah, over the last, what, uh, 15 years, he has been teaching people about Islam, about the Quran, and he has given hundreds of shahadas. He has helped hundreds of people accept Islam. So this young man from the village in Egypt, when he was born in 1977, I was there for his birth when he was born. When he got married about 15 years ago, I was there for his marriage. And every morning when I look at the mirror, I see this dude, I see this guy, because I just told you my story. SubhanAllah. Now, the reason I'm telling you this story is to show you if you want to learn something, you can do it with the help of Allah. If you work hard for it, if you have a good intention, right? And you can learn anything. You can learn Arabic. You can learn English, you can learn Turkish, Urdu, whatever you want to learn. If you want to learn coding, typing, artificial intelligence, I don't know, to design, you know, apps and programs. If you want to design an app like Muslim do, you need some learning and you need some training. My advice to you, work hard, put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you have to have a vision for your life and you have to have a good niya so you can leave a good legacy behind you. Don't let anyone make you feel like you are nobody. Let me repeat. Don't let anybody make you feel like you are nobody because you are somebody. Every one of you, brothers and sisters, boys and girls who are watching me now, you have a gift. Each and every one of you has a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of you have a good memory. You can memorize the Quran. Some of you are good with math and science. Some of you are good with coding. Some of you are good, have a beautiful voice. You can call the Adhan at Dar Foundation or Anatolia Islamic Center. So every one of you has a gift. Find this gift and use it. Now the problem is many of us, I know because I have kids, 
you guys are busy with your electronics, you are busy with your laptop, you are busy with your phone, you are playing video games, you are watching too much Netflix, you are watching too much Disney Plus. Your gift, if you don't find it, if you don't use it, you are going to lose it. You have to find the gift, you have to polish it and use it in order for you to leave a legacy behind. Let me tell you another story. This is a true story of a young African-American boy. He was growing up in the 1960s, early 1970s. He was probably in grade three or grade four. So his teacher was racist. It was very bad back then. You know, you remember uh, George Floyd, I can't breathe. It was much worse back then. So the teacher, the, she gave them an assignment and you know she basically told them, what would you like to be when you grow older? So the first kid, a white boy, he said, I wanted to be a doctor. And she was like, takbir. She didn't actually say takbir because she was not Muslim. And she put a star on his forehead. And she said, this is amazing. The second boy, white boy, what would you like to be? And he said, I want to be an engineer. And she was like, takbir. And she put a star on his forehead. Now it was the turn of this young boy, African-American boy. She said, what would you like to be boy? And he said, I want to be on TV. I want to be a TV host. Like Dr. Amjad Kosha, Jazallah Khair. He wanted to be a TV host. And, and he was African-American and the teacher was racist. So she started to make fun of him. And as a matter of fact, this young student, he had a stutter. He couldn't speak smoothly. So he used to stutter. He used to speak with difficulty. So she said, has your dad ever been on TV? And he said, no, 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 no. Has your mom ever been on TV? No, 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 no. And she said, if your mom, your dad, no one from your family has ever been on TV and you can't even talk, you're so pathetic. Sit down and shut up and don't talk about this stuff in my office again. So she tried to make him feel like nobody, but this guy became somebody because he believed in himself. Have you heard of Steve Harvey? Steve Harvey, this is his story. This is the guy. He's one of the most famous TV hosts of all time in American history. And you can watch his interview on YouTube. He talks about his racist teacher. She's still alive. And he says, Wallahi, every year he makes sure he buys and ships uh, an expensive LCD screen and he sends it to his teacher so she can watch him on TV. Every year he does the same thing. Well, this is funny, man. So find your gift, polish it so you can leave a legacy. Uh, and so people can remember you and make dua for you. Something that will benefit humanity and will benefit the ummah. I think of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu anhu. He left a great legacy. He was only 36 when he died, to the best of my knowledge. And Rasulullah said 70,000 angels came down for his funeral. Imam al-Nawawi, one of the greatest scholars of hadith in the history of Islam, who left Riyadh al-Salihin and the 14 Nawis, was only 45 years old when he died. Siba Wai, one of the greatest scholars of the Arabic language and Arabi and Nahwa and grammar, he was only 32 years old when he died. Minshawi of Egypt is still the, one of the greatest reciters of the Quran of all time, even though he died at the age of 49. Malcolm X was 39 years old when he died in 1964. He was 39 years old and till this day, he's one of the greatest Muslim leaders in American history. One of the greatest poets in, in Tunisian history. There's this little country in North Africa, North Africa, uh, Abul Qasim al-Shabbi, till this day is regarded as the poet. He is the greatest poet in Tunisian history, the national anthem, of Tunisia is the Shabu Yaman Arad al Haya and so on and so forth. He is the greatest poet of Tun in Tunisian history. He died at the age of 25 back in 1934. These great people that I just mentioned, they left a great legacy. They didn't count the years, they made the years count. What is your legacy? This is the question I leave you with. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you with knowledge and wisdom and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gift you with a legacy so people will make dua for you to benefit the ummah and to benefit humanity may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless and protect you and your families jazakallah khair for watching see you next time inshallah assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh
we came back again to you, respected brothers and sisters. Ramadan Mubarak, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your deeds, accept your siyam, may Allah accept your qiyam, Allahumma ameen. Muslim do application. It's not just uh, a device or an application through the device that you watch uh, videos. No, 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 no. It's designed to help you make things easy in terms of your relation with your local masjid or any masjid you would love to. You can book your Jum'ah prayer. You can book your Taraweeh prayer. You can book your Eid prayer because, you know, because of the restrictions of the Corona and the COVID-19, it became now part of our real life. I mean, let's be fair now. We are restricted. However, Alhamdulillah, still we have 15% of the capacity, but you can't go without booking. So Muslim do will help you to know the uh, prayer, uh, prayer times, to know the iqama. And if you want to support your local masjid, I repeat, your local masjid, when you go to the app, anything happens, any activities, you go to this small button, just you press it, you can help your local masjid. It's an amazing tool, actually, amazing management tool. Uh, it facilitates everything. We used to, to do it with a lot of efforts now just by a tick. A tick or two ticks or maximum three ticks and that's it. Everything is finished. Uh, on your behalf, I'm welcoming again uh, our sister Shahar Tashqandi, mashallah. Sister Shahid, just to remind you, graduating this year, inshallah, from University of Toronto, specializing in psychology and in neuroscience and will start the master's inshallah next year. She was with us last time in a very exceptional interview. Very nice. She has uh, four episodes with us in this Muslim Do application during month of Ramadan under the title of Muslim Women Stories of Inspiration. She has a very exceptional guest as well with her, Sister Fatima Zahra. She will introduce Fatima Zahra to you. Sister Shahid and Sister Fatima, for both of you, you are most welcome. Ramadan Mubarak wa ahla wa marhaban bikuma. Please. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakumullah khair, everyone. Um, so as promised, I will introduce my amazing guest, uh, Fatima. So Fatima is, inshallah, an incoming fourth year student studying environmental studies and forestry at the University of Toronto. She has served in the MSA for three years now, and inshallah, she'll be joining the MSA again, the Muslim Student Association, as president for the year. Uh, she also completed an internship with the Multifaith Center at U of T, where she planned interfaith events and combined environmental education from various beliefs and religions. Um, so thank you so much, Fatima, for joining us today. How are you? I'm good, alhamdulillah. Thank you so much for having me. Every opportunity to chat with Shahid is such an honor, so I'm excited for today. Thank you so much, Fatima. So um, given that we have 10 minutes, I'll get to the questions, inshallah, for our audiences. So as we said, you have been joining MSA, mashallah, for um, this will be your fourth year, inshallah. So my question for you is, why did you join the MSA? Yeah, uh, joining MSA in university was a no brainer because I had been so involved in, in high school and I knew what an important role that had in my life in high school. And so coming into university with this new space and new education and new people and all these things that were changing in my life, I knew that I wanted that stability of having the Muslim community and working on projects that brought me closer to my dean and having that sort of religious connection to it was so important to me. And I'm so grateful that I did because the opportunities I've had and the friendships that I've made have been incredible, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And we also talked about how you have uh, dedicated a lot of both your education and also your volunteer time uh, in environmental studies and environmental action. So I'm curious to know, how, do you, how did you combine your interest in environmental awareness and action uh, with your ability to serve the Muslim community? How did you find the middle ground between the two? Yeah, it's really the combination of my two worlds because environmental work is so important to me. And it's like you said, it's my, inshallah, my career and my education. And then Muslim work has always been a big part of my life. And so when I realized that it, they're not parallel parts of my identity, but they have this really incredible potential for collaboration, that was, it was a game changer. And so it started actually working with Shahid in my first year as the one of the environmental advocacy directors for the MSA. We hosted an event where we had speakers from different faiths come in and talk about environmentalism in their work. Um, and then I developed that a little bit more in my internship this year where I had a speaker series with experts from Christianity, Judaism, and Islam talking about what does 
what is the role of faith-based communities in environmental work and realizing how much influence they already have in bringing their congregation members towards good work and good values and morals. And when you introduce environmentalism as a good moral that has roots in scripture, there's so much potential there. And so the final thing that I worked on this year was I worked with Enviro Muslims, an organization to write a toolkit to guide messages through um, how to incorporate environmentalism in their waste, in their energy consumption, in their community work. And we worked with imams across Canada to understand how this would be best implemented and what kind of advice that they think would be helpful. And it's exciting. It's going to launch later this month, I believe. And it's going to be a really exciting opportunity to see that in action, inshallah. MashaAllah. Um, so about the toolkits, where would uh, people be able to find that uh, once it's published? It's on the Faith in the Common Good website. There are our funders for the project. Um, I can send you the link and we can, we can have that be available. And then messages can take the pledge to do that. And then they'll be sent the, the toolkit from Faith in the Common Good. That would be amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, along our conversation, um, you have served, uh, I believe, as vice president external for the past year at the Muslim Student Association. And as we have all seen, we have been hit by COVID this year, and it has affected all, all student organizations as well as Muslim communities. So I'm curious to know, how did you and your team manage the COVID situation and make the most out of it? Yeah, COVID, I mean, it's been so bittersweet because of course, the in-person experience of, you know, running into people at Jama and all of that sort of in-person being at the masjid and being on campus is unparalleled. Uh, but it's definitely opened up some interesting doors. We've been able to reach people that wouldn't have had time or wouldn't have been on campus for our events and definitely hosted speakers that we never would have been able to before. Also, it really forced us to be creative because I think there's often a tendency to want to like see what has been done in the past and come into a role and just do that again. But that really wasn't an option this year. And so seeing how like we had online Joma and um, reminders every week. And so UFTMSA hosts three Jummas. If you attend one, you have you've missed out on the two other khutbas. But having that be something online and something accessible to everybody and it just stays on the internet is a cool new creative twist that only the pandemic offered to us and it changed the way that we operate. And so it's definitely been bittersweet and it's exciting to see how that continues to change. I love that, mashallah. I know I personally have attended uh, events at the MSA this year that I know I wouldn't have been able to <laughs> because of the distance, um, because of the online thing. Um, so that was definitely amazing. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so along the same topic, uh, what is one of the things that you're most proud of accomplishing at the MSA or at any of your other roles? Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, MSA work is such a testament to the idea of like it takes a village and I couldn't take credit for anything that we do because it's, it's such a team effort. One of the things that I'm happiest to have been a part of is the mentorship program this year, um, especially with the, the isolation that comes with being online. Sometimes two of my directors, Aisha and Mahnoor, developed a mentorship program where upper years and lower years and alumni can network together and have this one-on-one -on -one connection. And being able to create that platform for people to talk to people in their academic fields and really understand what, what have Muslims in my field gone through and what advice I can go through, that was super amazing. And hearing feedback from that has been really fulfilling. So I'm, I'm really happy to have been able to be a part of that this year. Alhamdulillah. And inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put barakah in it for many years to come, inshallah. Mm -hmm. um, so looking forward to next year, what are some of the things that you're most excited to accomplish inshallah as president of the MSA? Oh the million dollar question. Um, so many things come to mind about what I want MSA to look like next year inshallah and I mean the actual events and what it looks like from the outside is, is so dependent on the directors and I know everything that I've worked on the things that stand out to me are the things that I've been personally connected to so making sure all of the events are things that the directors absolutely are passionate about working on. So on my end, what I'm excited to provide is support. I think I've, I've grown so much from being with leadership that fosters growth. And so especially making sure that things that worked online continue and the creativity that we saw with the mentorship program and the humans of the Umma blog posts and things that really were amazing online, seeing how we can keep that going in person because inshallah we'll be in person um, and seeing how we can continue that inshallah is something I'm gonna focus on. Inshallah. 
And so my final question, and I think this is uh, the most important because we have a lot of uh, Muslims watching us from all around the, uh, Canada and many of whom may, have, may be working in the MSA, inshallah. So what advice would you give for people uh, working in the Muslim Students Association or uh, want to bring new ideas to the MSA? Yeah, I think something that we learned this year was the value of collaborations and reaching out to people for support, because I think so much of what happened this year wouldn't have been possible if we didn't reach out to people who've either done our roles before or are, who are doing similar ones in other parts of the community. And so, I mean, I never get old of, I never get tired of sitting in conversations with a, with a five person MSA and a 30 person MSA and understanding how they approach a problem. There's so much to be learned from the way that different teams work. And so, you know, we had conversations about different MSAs saying, we're trying to set up a prayer room. How did you do it? Or, you know, we were setting up a, a magazine and we're facing this kind of a, of a trouble. And those kinds of co conversations and realizing that while community work sometimes feels like we're in our own little bubble, so often it's the same problems that we're all facing and the same little obstacles that really aren't that big in the grand scheme of things, but can seem so big. And so overcoming that and reaching out to people for support has helped our team so much. And I think has been so important for the success of MSAs in the pandemic, because I know this time last year, we were thinking about like, how are we going to continue without things that are in person? And so, yeah, making sure that you realize that there's so much support out there and it just takes reaching out and understanding all the people that are out there and willing to support you. We're also excited to see the success of, of other community groups and other MSAs. And it's great to see that that's something that we've learned this year. I love that so much. And uh, I believe there is an organization now that ha houses all the MSAs, right? The Yeah, the yeah. Ontario MSA Council. Yeah, that's been, it's been really helpful for keeping MSAs, that kind of communication open. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Fatima. This has been an amazing discussion, very educational, and I hope all our listeners have benefited from this. Um, do you have any final words or anything? Thank you so much for having me. Um, if you'd like to join UFT MSA, our applications are opening soon. We're so excited to welcome in a new team. Um, and if you're not at UFT, join an MSA or a community organization that's doing this kind of work. It's so fulfilling and inshallah, it's, it's a beneficial experience for all of us in, in this world and in the next, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair Fatima for agreeing to join us for this amazing session. Um, this has uh, been for uh, all for our episode. Uh, thank you all so much. And please join us tomorrow, same time, uh, for another episode with Sister Yasmin Yusuf, who is the program manager of Nisa Homes, inshallah. Uh, thank you all so much for the opportunity. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.